Hello everyone, and welcome to a new series I am going to do called Queer as a Painting. Um, this is going to be a new, sort of similar to my old podcast slash YouTube show where I, um, where I will be looking at a product, whether it be a comic, an anime, a cartoon, a TV show, whatever, and trying to give my spin on it and break it down, analyze it, try and give a queer perspective, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to do a, and, and it's going to vary. I'm not going to just do what I used to do, which was, um, you know, just just like watch the episode, do a breakdown. I want to kind of do like some dramatic readings. I want to do some. I, I don't know what else. <laughs> I don't have anything else planned yet. But there'll be other things. Maybe interviews. <laughs> Maybe I'll get interviews with people. That'd be cool. Uh, so sort of diversify. Try different things. Try to make it a little less like here's, you know, 30 episodes about even going in. Uh, yeah. So the first thing I wanted to do was there is a new Gargoyles comic out, which if anyone's not aware, Gargoyles is a comic from... The uh, it's not a comic; it's a cartoon from the '90s. So back when I was a little, little kid uh, in 1995, 1994, there was this show called Gargoyles, and it was about these uh, monsters, basically that turn to stone by day, and then they are, you know, crime fighters by night. It's typical superhero stuff. But it was really good because it, it invoked a lot of like Shakespeare and fantasy and myth, and it was. Uh, it had a really good writer behind it, Greg Wiseman, who is, like, super, super active and involved in the online community for his own show, which is always, you know, we love to see it. And, uh, yeah, so he recently, in the last, uh, I guess it was last year, he came up with this, he, he, he made a deal with Dynamite Comics to do a new comic series based on the show. Um, they had done... So they did the original two seasons of the TV show, which was 65 episodes, because the second season is, like astronomically long and then in the 2000s late 2000s he got a chance with slave labor graphics to do a new comic uh which was a 12 12 volume 12 issue run two volumes 12 issues and uh it was a it was pretty cool and uh so now he's getting another chance he's getting his third chance at the uh typewriter so to speak and uh so yeah so that's that's out now um and obviously, as it was a cartoon with lots of actors I love, lots of actors people know, Keith David, Clancy Brown, um, who else? Jeff Bennett, Jim Cummings, uh, uh, Ed Asner's in it. Lots and lots of really great people. I thought, why not do a dramatic reading of the comic itself? And uh, yeah, so I thought that would be fun. And I'm going to do it. So I'm not going to describe the images. I'm just going to read the dialogue in the text boxes. Uh, partly, I don't want this to be a substitute for reading the comic. I think this is kind of, this isn't a big uh, comic franchise, right? This isn't Batman. It's not going to be forever. So I'm really encouraging people to go out. It's available on Amazon. It's available in lots of places. Go out and buy it <laughs> um, if you can, if you can afford it, whatever. And read along. So read the comic and listen to, you know, it's basically like an audio book, right? So you read along and you listen to the audio as you're reading along. That's my kind of goal with this. And uh, I think it's going to be fun. So let's get started. This is Gargoyles Number 1. Written by Greg Weissman. Art by George Cambadeus. Well, he's the illustrator. So we start with our typical narration. Stone by day. Warriors by night, we were betrayed by the humans we had sworn to protect, frozen in stone by a magic spell for a thousand years. Now here in Manhattan, the spell is broken, and we live again! We are defenders of the night. We are gargoyles! It's nighttime here in Manhattan, and things always get a little crazy at night. My name is Elisa Maza. I'm an NYPD detective assigned to the 23rd Precinct. Sorry, Elisa. I know this was supposed to be your night off. My partner, Detective Matt Bluestone. Yeah, well, I guess no one told those ATM bandits. Should I call for backup? No need. 
backups already here. No. Like I said, things always get a little crazy around here at night. No, 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 no. Gargoyles, here in Manhattan, chapter one, a little crazy. No! Wait, stop, we surrender! Dude, I'm driving here, man! I am neither a dude nor a man, not in any sense of the word. Right, right, sorry, uh, miss? Now I'm driving here. Scoot over, you stooges. Make room for Curly here. I don't get it, Detective. You took down all three of these perps by yourself? Detective Maza helped, but it's her night off, so I let her breeze. That's against regs. Oh, don't sweat it. She has friends in high places. See, a few years ago, I caught a case here at the Erie Building. You know the place. Tallest building in the world. With a big medieval castle as the cherry on top. Anyway, I snuck in to investigate a pretty massive public disturbance, and from that point on, my whole life got with the crazy. Still, I guess the story really started back in the Dark Ages. Superstition and the sword ruled, or so I've been told. It was a time of darkness. It was a world of fear. It was the age of gargoyles. Their clan was frozen in stone by a magic spell for a thousand years. Now, here in Manhattan, the spell is broken, and they live again. They are defenders of the night. They are, well, you get the idea. Elisa. Goliath. This is Goliath, leader of the Manhattan clan of gargoyles. And okay, yeah, he's kind of my boyfriend. So fine, I found love on a parapet. Just another romance with all its perks and problems. Missed you. And I you. I know, I know, it's not normal, but hey, normalcy's overrated. Jeez, you two. We've got an impressionable minor here. Oh, please, I've seen Snoggin before. And the expression of affection is nothing to be ashamed of. Too true. This is Brooklyn, Goliath's second in command. Come on, I was kidding. Not everyone appreciates your unique sense of humor, my love. And Brooklyn's mate, Katana, he met her in feudal Japan. Don't ask. And this is Brooklyn's rookery brother, Lexington. What's snogging? British for kissing. Uh, and Brooklyn and Katana's son, Nashville. Oh, good to know. Thanks, Nashville. For the gazillionth time, it's Nash with a silent G. Though he prefers Nash. Where are cold stone and cold fire? Still on patrol, I assume. This is Hudson, Goliath's mentor. And this is Brooklyn and Lex's other rookery brother, Broadway. After all, they don't need sleep. Just a recharge now and then. And Goliath's daughter, Angela. She and I are like sisters. It's not as weird as it sounds. And maybe a snuggle, too? Are you asking about them or us? They're dating. S uh, snuggling sounds... Calm yourself. I want to check the rookery first. It wasn't that long ago that Brooklyn, Lex, and Broadway were like the three musketeers. Practically joined at the hip, or at least the wingtip. But kids grow up. Things change. All right, rookery first. Can I go on patrol? No! Hmm. <laughs> It's Matt. I better call him back. Rikers Island, New York City's primary jail complex and one of the largest correctional institutes in the world. You see, I bet I know why Matt's calling. About a year ago, we had a gang war in Manhattan, pitting Tony Dracon, head of the Dracon crime family, against Tomash Brode, a gangster trying to cut in on Dracon turf. Matt and I busted them both with a little help from the gargoyles. Okay, with a lot of help from the gargoyles. We made them share a cell because we thought it would be funny. But you know what isn't funny? Broad's people hit another Dracon drug lab. We've got six injured, including a bystander. With their bosses behind bars and their syndicates in shambles, Broad and Dracon's foot soldiers are fighting over the scraps. And they're not the only ones. Are we sure it was Broad's men? Every criminal organization in the city is getting in on the act. See, by arresting the top dogs, we created a power vacuum. Pretty sure this time, I'm currently watching Tony's right-hand man, Glasses, and Broad's consigliere, Jack Dane, glaring at each other. But I don't have the evidence to arrest either one. And it seems even human nature abhors a vacuum. The humans are at war again, and I wonder if we should not allow them to destroy each other. Do not say such things, my love. I'll have to get back to you. 
Cold Stone and Cold Fire. He's a zombie cyborg. She's a robot. Each harbors the soul of a gargoyle from Goliath's Scottish clan. I realize that sounds pretty complicated, but trust me, it's all you really need to know. We did our best to mitigate the damage. Our electronic ears and microprocessors uh, singled out the particle beam fire from among the Manhattan cacophony, and our entrance attracted the customary attention from both sides. Thus, for a time, we became their target of mutual ire. But even with the likes of us as a distraction... Forget the monsters! Hit Dracon's crew! They quickly resumed their conflict. You're dead, Dane! Dead! So I ignited a reason to force a separation and truce. Then we fled before the Manhattan authorities could arrive. I do not like this word, fled. Nor do I understand why it is acceptable to reveal ourselves to the scum of humanity, and not to the very humans we have sworn to protect. It is difficult to reconcile, but a thousand years ago, humans often mistrusted us, even though we were a common sight. Thus, it is hardly surprising when our race has been until recently the stuff of legend that they might fear us now. Honestly, humans haven't even learned to get along with each other. We're hardwired for sectarianism and scapegoating. Accepting another species won't come easy. Then why protect them? Because a true gargoyle can no more stop protecting the castle than breathing the air. And Castle Manhattan requires our protection. We will not hide from the humans, but we will also give them time to know us, while protecting our castle from all possible dangers, so that some day we might live here together in harmony. And in the meantime, let us use our legend to bedevil Manhattan's miscreants. If human criminals are a superstitious and cowardly lot, that may work to our advantage. Goliath, are you quoting the Cape Crusader? I do not believe so. Who is this crusader? Might he be of some use to our cause? Never mind. Is it Detective Bluestone again? Actually, no. It's it's my brother. Hey, Tony, you here? Hear what? Good news, man. They're letting your gramps out of Bellevue and your uncle out of Sing Sing. Hmm. Two top dogs back on this street for the Dracons. So why you not happy, Rumi? So my brother Derek Mazza... That's another complicated story. Derek went to work for an evil megalomaniac who had his own personal mad scientist inject my brother with a potent mutagenic formula comprised of panther, bat, and electric eel DNA. All right, I paged my sister. A uh, great boss cat, which transformed Derek into the mutate known as Talon. Talon founded the underground community known as the Labyrinth, comprised of mutates, outsiders, and even a few gargoyle clones. Uh, more on them some other time. But given the current situation... Now, with his partner Maggie the Cat, my mutate brother is about to become a mutate father. Don't you think you'd better page the doctor? Or maybe call the midwife? Uh, right. Right, doctor, midwife, yeah. It's happening. No, I mean it's happening right now. If you plan on taking an interest in this child from birth, you may want to stake your claim sooner than later. Message received and understood. And for the record, I've already taken an interest in this child. In fact, I intend to adopt him or her to raise as my own. Adopt? <laughs> the kid's not exactly an orphan. No, not yet. Excuse us, we need to recharge. You called it. I did. It seems we all require a recharge. The sun rises. We must take our leave of you until nightfall. I'll miss you. And I you. Okay, yeah, my boyfriend turns to stone every morning. Nobody's perfect, right? And hey, I warned you my life was a little crazy. Besides, the timing works out just fine. I mean, I have to head down to the labyrinth to meet my new niece or nephew. And here in Manhattan, things aren't nearly as crazy during the day, so... No worries. Next time, a lot of crazy... Yeah, so that was that was cool. I really enjoyed doing that. I really enjoyed reading that and doing all the different voices of the characters and stuff. Um, the comic itself, not bad. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff. A lot of uh, a lot of setup. <laughs> not a lot of story. Um, the recap is pretty good. I I kind of wonder 
if we need so much recap. Um, I kind of thought that before I read the comic. I'm like, oh, uh, do we really need to know all this different stuff? Do we need to involve so many different pieces and characters? And I'm recording this after I've read uh, four issues of the comic. I was gonna say three, but I've read four. Um, but I, f I finished this arc. There's like it's like three, three, three issues is like a sort of like a story arc. Is kind of what Greg Weissman said. So I know how the story arc ends, and I and I and I do kind of wonder did we did we need all like twelve main characters as part of this story? Do we need Cold Fire? Do we need Cold Steel? Or not Cold Steel, sorry. Cold Stone, Cold Fire, and the rest. Did, is, that, is that really necessary to touch on all these different pieces? Uh, maybe it will be in the long term. Um, maybe we will need to know about Katana and the Egg and the Rookery and all that. And I'm, I'm sure we will. I'm sure he didn't just put it in there for fun. But it does feel very bloated as a result. It feels like there's not a lot of, of wiggle room. I, I really like Elisa's narration. I like seeing her point of view. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the, I think Nash is cute. I think, um, I like seeing Goliath when he is, uh, cause often in the old show, Goliath is a very reactive character. This is a very typical 90s superhero thing. Bad thing happens, hero has to react, and that's really their, sort of their agency or their, the, what, what motivates their behavior is just reacting to bad things happening. And I like that Goliath here is sort of getting his people, getting his friends and his people together and say, okay, here's my plan. <laughs> here's what we're going to do. Here's how I am going to create ra racial harmony in Manhattan, uh, <laughs> which is maybe a bit naive of Goliath, but it's really interesting to see him um, sort of map something out rather than just, oh no, Xanatos has a new evil plan. I got to stop him. I got to react. Uh, so it's good to see when the hero is able to be proactive and identify a problem before it happens. I really like that. Um, yeah. I like the art a lot. The SLG comic in the 2000s had really inconsistent art. Kind of maybe not so good art sometimes, in all honesty. But here we have one artist, one vision. I really like the style of it. I think it's really cool to see... This sort of, it's sort of like the cartoon, but it's not exactly like the cartoon. It's a little softer. It's a little more modernized, which is, which is nice. Uh, I think it is also very effective. Uh, I think he really also, he also the acting, like, you know, the artist has to do kind of acting with the, the face and stuff when they're drawing and sort of create a, you know, a emotional, emotional milieu with just just the still image of the face. And it's, it's really good. I, th I think you really get a sense of who each character is and what they're thinking and what they, what they want and what they're doing. And that's really neat. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, s the supporting elements. Uh, we see Morgan quickly. Morgan is a, a classic character from the show. Gr Greg Wiseman likes to create his cast of thousands, right? So <laughs> you'll, you'll run into a cop character and, and this is something Hill Street Blues did. This is something, that uh, Vince Gilligan really likes doing on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul is having like this one little incidental character and like, okay, we need a cop character for this scene. And then not just stopping there and being like, okay, that cop character, we never see him again. But actually like they come back and they have a personality and they have, you know, different elements to them. So it's, it feels like a bigger, more fully realized world. Again, can get a little overwhelming, but yeah, that's neither here nor there. Um, the action sequences were cool. I really liked seeing Cold Fire and Cold Stone fighting evil. So even though I, th I think it's too many characters, I really like Cold Steel, uh, Cold Stone, I keep saying Cold Steel, uh, uh, Cold Stone and Cold Fire. I think they're really awesome characters. I love their personalities. I've always, always, always wanted to see more, more Cold Fire because really the only role she ever had in the original show was to be... Cold Stone's conscience and say, should we really do this? Is this the right thing to do? We should do something more noble, more just. And that's hopefully not what she's going to be in this story. Um, I will not talk too much about that until we get to it later. But uh, so it, anyway, it was cool to see her involved in the action sequence and um, doing some stuff, really. 
Uh, I, I like seeing Tomas Brode again. I always loved Glasses. I love that his name is Glasses. That's just like, like, how did he get that nickname? Like, he's just, he's just named after. A, like, he wears like lots of people wear glasses, but he's defined by the fact that he wears glasses. <laughs> uh, maybe Tony's not the most creative guy when he was giving out nicknames to his uh, his cohorts. Uh, we also get a little bit of foreshadowing with the Dracon family. I'm not that into the Dracons. I think they're kind of a means to an end. This isn't like uh, Spider-Man, the Spider-Man show, where we had like Silvermane and, you know, the big man, or we have Kingpin, or we have like these really noteworthy characters. Uh, Tony's kind of a doofus a little bit. He's kind of just, he's he's kind of, he's kind of just, you know, a C-list villain, villain of the week for them to vanquish. Uh, there's not much more to him. Maybe this comic will change that. Maybe it'll change my perspective. I hope so, <laughs> perhaps, but uh, it, it, it will be interesting to see how, if, if we are outlining how Goliath wants to, because uh, part of Goliath's outline was, he's like, well, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep to ourselves. We'll keep a low profile until people really learn to be around us. I'm not sure if that's really a good attitude, but anyway, that's his attitude. That's his perspective. That's consistent with his character. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other part of it was, and then we'll fight crime. <laughs> we'll fight crime. We'll, we'll be around and we'll fight crime and, and deal with ne'er-do-wells in this, in this city we've chosen to protect. So I, th I think Greg actually did a really good job there. Um, Greg Wiseman did a really good job sort of outlining who the character is and what he wants to do, which is we have to protect Manhattan because that's what a gargoyle does. So it's all, it's all kind of really summed up really well in this one little exchange between him and Coldstone. And uh, very in character, of course, Goliath is perpetually always trying to do the right thing and always trying to be the hero. And Coldstone, is, he's a little more selfish. He's a little more, he's a little less inclined to do the right thing. He's just, yeah. So that's really cool. And to create that contrast. And that's been a really underdeveloped relationship, which I think it's great that they're sort of focusing in on that now. And, or they, and that Greg is really focusing in on that relationship now and expanding on it. It's something I'd love to see. Um, that's really all I, I think I got. Uh, the the humor's a bit hit and miss for me. The jokes are a little bit silly. Um, I, I don't know if I laughed at them, but you got to have a bit of levity. You got to have a bit, of, a bit of texture, that kind of texture in the story. So didn't really work for me, but it's fine. Uh, yeah, so that, that's really cool. I want to do more of these. I want to do more of these dramatic readings with reviews. If you like them, let me know, and I'll do more. Uh, I do have a Patreon. I'm not going to do bonus content for now, but I am going to reopen it. I've had it frozen for the last couple of months. We did our last uh, podcast episode in, I think, December, November, something like that. And I've frozen it every month since then. Um, I'm going to reopen it now. I'm going to unfreeze it. And uh, so, yeah, if you like this content, feel free to uh, make a pledge, any pledge. I'm not going to have a, a, a cutoff anymore. Just just if you like the show, you can pledge. That's that's all that's going to be from now on uh, for at least for a while. Maybe I'll do bonus content later if I have, uh, you know, if I have a good idea or something. It's, it's hard to think of bonus content to do with a, a, a thing like this because I can't give you like my WIPs or anything. I could I could do a Q&A maybe or something. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out later. But for now, if you like it, you can pledge. And uh, that's about all I got. Um, I will do another one. Let's do these. Let's do these bi-weekly until I'm caught up. So I've got I've got four episodes and then maybe I'll do some other content in the interim. Um, but yeah, I'll stick to a bi-weekly schedule for now. I want to thank everyone for listening. Catch you next time.